In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In the Abrahamic tradition, this 26-word passage recounts the calling of one of the greater prophets of the Old Testament, a greater prophet that in a new covenant or New Testament, if one prefers, has found many in the Christian faith tradition attributing to the deliverance of a prophetic and defining message, the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, their Lord, and their Savior. Twenty-six words that I might humbly beseech and entreat you to consider upon examination of the deeper syntax should have been a verse of 27 words. Adding to that passage the conditional conjunction modifying the entire phrase that was the same word found in the Latin translation, et ne nos in ducas in temptationum sed liber nos amalo, or lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A somewhat confusing phrase in itself. I prefer for your consideration further in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord, but sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, but sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. For those not familiar with Isaiah, he was essentially what one might describe as a preacher's kid, raised to follow in the family business of being another preacher man a son of a preacher man raised in the house of the priests and called thereby, if not therefore, to become another preacher or minister of the gospel, so to speak, as Reverend King had described as a marvelous picture, always beautiful to see. But in the year that King Isaiah died, Something extraordinary, out of the ordinary, happened to have happened to a preacher's kid named Isaiah. He saw also the Lord, but sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. My name is Major Mike Webb, and like Isaiah, I too claim the notorious distinction, most notorious distinction of being a son of a preacher man. And perhaps the very first time that I can recall hearing the story of the calling of Isaiah, 
I found myself at a Christian church camp, like many children who grow up in a community of faith, in fellowship, raised up in a way that they should go, that when they become old, they should not depart from it. And like many babes in the faith, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, can I get an aid, man? I put away those childish things. Yet we all knew that change may be inevitable while growth is optional. And when I had first heard this particular passage in the course of a dramatic reading filled with the spectacle of lights and dazzling images upon a stage in a fellowship hall accompanied by music, where well, we had even played childlike games, perhaps like many, still yet unfamiliar with the books of Chronicles of the Old Testament. I was of the distinct impression that one King Uzziah had actually died, serving as the predicate offense or precipitating cause in first causes for this rather marvelous transfiguration of a preacher's kid. More transfiguring than the word addition, but in that first sentence of 26 words. Perhaps he had been stirred by mourning and grief. Perhaps it was just some strange coincidence. But in that defining moment of his recollection regarding a transition, the old gone and the new come, a calling of a preacher's kid to continue in the line of his fathers and their fathers, it was my nation thought as a babe in faith at the death of one political figure of the day and age, had prompted within Isaiah an intimate relationship with one who he would call his Lord, called to preach the gospel. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe! is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts the true king but the historical and empirical fact is that in the year that Isaiah saw also the lord King Uzziah had become as dead to the world and all around him, disdained and despised even by his own family as unclean, having been stricken with leprosy for daring to profane the Lord, who he came to see also in the year one inchoate prophet named Isaiah saw also the Lord but sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train, his train filled the temple. Not my will, but thy will be done. Transforming the I to the thou. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. 
Also, I heard the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Some from a very early point had described 2020 as the election of their lifetime. In a once in a lifetime pandemic, an election that went on even through a global public health crisis that by the end of its first year of declaration of pandemic would find as many as 527,000 American fatalities described by the president as irreplaceable souls on the first anniversary while announcing an American rescue plan and numbering more dead at that time than both world wars, the conflict in Southeast Asia and 9-11 combined with yet a promise if all did their part, we might finally realize an end to disruption and a return to normalcy on an independence declaration day from a time when, in which he had claimed, even if it had been different for everyone, we had all lost something. And in 2020, if I seem to be a preacher's kid again, again having a try at running for Congress until a pandemic happened to get in the way. And for many, pandemic was just another inconvenience that at some point would pass into past memories so that we could return to our lives again after the pandemic. But for whatever reason, I found myself in the courts commencing the very first and longest surviving litigation challenges against the lockdowns, the very first and longest surviving litigation challenges against the non-medical grade facial coverings, the very first and longest surviving litigation challenges against what had been described as the vaccine's mandates, albeit according to the emergency use authorization, only COVID-19 countermeasures. And those litigations even survived after an election in which I had been denied the opportunity to qualify for the 2020 November ballot. And so while the elections went on and life went on for everyone else, time stopped for me stuck in the courts, litigating that time. Still arguing about the foreign election of a lifetime had become the focus of yet another new controversy dividing a nation in which the fate of democracy had become at stake. I was stuck in the time, still at the beginning of the pandemic, in court, which directed my focus not to the surges and spikes in infections, the rising death tolls, finally exceeding a million. But at the beginning where it had all begun, and now those same matters which have caused a half dozen petitions for certiorari to be docketed at the nation's highest court, in a right of due process to be heard in a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner, are now only being granted an opportunity for argument in the next term for the nation's highest court. But now blocked on a procedural matter in denial of a petition to proceed in what courts describe as in forma pauperis. A state of sufficient poverty not to be required to pay court fees. A state of poverty apparently common to most of the victims who have become fatalities to a novel coronavirus. A poor people's campaign, like in Gallup County, Virginia, a rural community in southwest Virginia, Shenandoah, where I went to school, which by April of this year had topped the national list for intersection of poverty and death rates, exceeding even places like the Bronx, a community in my own state to which I have never actually ever been, like Chesterfield, where I now also have a case, but now sharing common a connection 
with those communities of the poor and the courts. And he said, go tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of life. But yet in it shall be a tent, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal and as an oak whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb.